Recursion. Love it or hate it, it is a huge part of computer science. In fact, the earlier you get used to it, the earlier you get comfortable with it, the better. Now, we've looked at recursion on this channel multiple times in the past, so I'm not going to actually delve very deeply into what recursion actually is. Instead, today, let's look at a fun example of recursion, and let's actually attempt to implement it on our own. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at the coach fractal. And at the end of the day, you will be able to draw a simple diagram like this one. So yeah, hopefully you're excited. Let's jump into this random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. So we're going to be talking about the coach fractal. Remember that recursion has sort of a recursive case and a base case? Well, this is sort of the graphical equivalent to that. The base case of a coach fractal, in other words, the smallest unit of a coach fractal, is in fact this. This is the fundamental unit of a coach fractal. It is just, well, a simple sort of triangular shape with lines protruding out. The way we're going to approach constructing this is we're going to start from an origin. We're going to actually just trace out a line, make a rotation, trace out another line, another line, and another. So yeah, it's simple as that, but there are some interesting points to note about this base case. First and foremost, the little figure in the center is actually an equilateral triangle. If you remember your you know, middle school math, you will of course know that all the internal angles are 60 degrees. Also, all the edges have the same length. Now, there is one more property of interest to us here, and that is the fact that for the other two line segments, they are also of the same length. The recursive case is when we actually replace the line segments with, well, a scaled down version of the base case. That is, instead of drawing this straight line here, I'm going to actually plonk in another copy of the coach fractal. Same deal for the others, and what you'll find at the end of the day is that, well, the base case now appears four times to replace all of these straight edges. Can we repeat this? Certainly we can. Every single straight edge you see on screen can be replaced with another copy of the base case, this time much smaller. And in fact, we can do that again and again as many times as we like. The shape becomes more and more complex, but of course the details become smaller and smaller, so past the certain points, there's really no reason to do it anymore. That is the fundamental concept behind a coach fractal. And what we're going to do is, well, we're going to write code that builds it. For this purpose, we're going to be using HTML5 and JavaScript, and what that means of course is that we'll be running this in a browser. However, you don't have to do the same. You can use any programming language you like, as long as it supports the following two things. First and foremost, it of course needs to be able to generate graphics, that's kind of important. And you'll of course need to be able to write recursive procedures. If you're not able to do that, you won't be able to generate a coach curve, which is of course well, recursive in nature. So alright, with that said, let us jump into our code itself. Setting up the actual body of the page is extremely simple. You just want to set up a canvas with an ID. What I've done here also is that I've set the width and the height to a 720p resolution, and I've also given it a little background color so I can sort of tell it apart from the rest of the window. So depending on your screen resolution, you should be seeing something like this a little grey box on top of an otherwise empty page. So now we can go ahead and add a hit to the top of the HTML document as well as script tags. What we're going to do is we're going to write a little initialization function which will run when the body loads. So this is the code you should have up till this point. Let us now actually move ahead to set up a little helper function. Basically, this function is going to be called walk. And the whole point is, we want to actually, you know, from any point on the screen, given an angle as well as a distance, basically we want to connect a line from the original point to the new point. In other words, we want to actually draw out this line. Now, this can be quite complex because, well, all the points on screen are actually represented with coordinates. So using an angle and a distance, in other words, we are actually using polar coordinates, well, we're going to have to do a little bit of math to convert it to this form, the Cartesian coordinate form. Now, 
The next couple of slides are going to be math, so if that's not your thing, feel free to skip ahead, I will give you the actual code. But if you want a more complete experience, do hang around, I'll try to make the math as simple as possible. So here's the deal. Starting from a point that is at 0, 0, the origin, we supply an angle and a distance. So the angle is denoted by theta, the distance by d. One way to look at this would be to actually turn it into a right angle triangle. And basically the topmost vertex is the destination coordinate that we want to go to. This representation makes things very easy to see because, well, the coordinates of that position can be given by the lengths of the two other sides of the triangle. So yeah, it's just a very convenient representation. Of course, using a right angle triangle means we can do some cool things. Do you remember these statements from middle school? Well, this is basic trigonometry. If you can't remember what these terms mean, that's okay, we'll look at it in terms of our triangle. Given this angle here, this length is opposite the angle. This length is adjacent to it, and the hypotenuse is just, well, the longest edge in a right angle triangle. So rearranging the two equations, because, well, these two are the quantities that we don't know, we can basically put this back into the equation itself. So yeah, just very basic trigonometry at work here. But this triangle runs on one assumption, and that is the fact that we're starting at the origin. Now, if we're not starting at the origin, if we're starting at some point x1, y1, well, that's no problem, because these two distances don't change. The new x is simply this distance plus the existing x. Same goes for the vertical, y2 is simply y1 plus this distance. So yeah, hopefully that's not too confusing. Let's now go and build our walk function. We will also add three global variables to help us here. The heading just refers to the current direction, you know, that is just an overall direction for the entire program. And x and y simply represents the current position we are at right now. All we have to do is to take these two statements and convert them into code. So well, it looks something like this. We can use the incrementation operator instead of, you know, having to take x plus this. The distance variable that is being supplied here is simply the long edge of the triangle. Instead of using theta, all we are doing is we're using the heading variable that I've explained earlier on. So yeah, in fact, in code, it just looks like this. But actually, there is one more thing we need to do, and that is to convert the angle from degrees to radians. Depending on what programming language you're using, this may be optional. In JavaScript, it is not. All the trig functions work in radians, which is why we need to perform this conversion. Now, ultimately, the reason why we do this is we want to draw a line on screen. So what we're going to have to add to this function is something that helps us draw a line. But we're not ready to do that just yet, which is why we go back to our init function to add in a statement that gets the context. In JavaScript, a context object is what you use to actually draw to a canvas, so there should be something similar for you in your programming language of choice. In this case, the context object will be put into a global variable, you know, just to make things easy for me. This statement basically just picks out the canvas object, you know, from the HTML page, and then gets the 2D context from that canvas. We can then move on to basically add a context line to statement to our walk function. So this just means draw a line from the last known position to the new x and y positions we've calculated. Finally, we can move on to the exciting part, which is the Koch function itself. This function takes in two parameters. Firstly, n, which is telling us, you know, how many recursion levels deep we want to go, as well as a length function. And this tells us how long we want the Koch curve to actually be. Now, it's always good practice to start from the base case, which is why we have this here. If n equals to 1, that means, well, that is the base case. We're not going to, you know, do more recursion. How do we implement the base case? Like this. This just draws out that fundamental shape we've already seen so many times. But, you know, just to be explicitly clear, let's actually trace through this line by line. But before we do that, let's try and understand why the length is length over 3 and not, you know, any other value. Now, if I want a curve to be this length, well, what this method basically does is it breaks down this length into three equal parts, like so. 
Don't forget, the little triangle in the middle is an equilateral triangle, which means, well, it fits nicely over the middle segment and has the same length. So yeah, hopefully that tells you why we use this particular length and not anything else. So let's sort of trace through this code. What I have here is what we call in programming sort of a turtle. This will tell us where we are right now, you know, when it comes to drawing the line. And it'll also tell you what direction we are actually pointed in. So the next time we walk, that's the direction we're going to walk in. Firstly, we just want to walk for a distance of length divided by 3. In other words, it's going to move along this line. The next statement says we want to do a negative rotation of 60 degrees. In other words, we're rotating counterclockwise 60 degrees. So the turtle is now oriented this way. We want to walk forward again for our known length. That puts the turtle here. We want to make another rotation. This time it is 120 degrees clockwise. So yeah, based on what the figure is doing, we're just going to be turning and facing, you know, the other edge of the triangle. Again, we walk forwards. And finally, we perform another counterclockwise 60 degree turn, putting us back in line. Then we simply walk forward and complete the curve. Let us now go ahead and test our function. Now, what I recommend you do here is to actually set the beginning X and Y to 50 and 540. That just sort of positions your curve in a nice position to start. Go ahead and add a few things to your init statement. Now, again, this one is programming language dependent, but the way JavaScript does it is you have to say begin path, move the cursor however you like in between, and end off with stroke. That actually causes the entire curve to be drawn out. What this of course means is that our coach function call needs to be somewhere in between. Before we do that, however, we have to say move to x and y, bearing in mind that x and y are the two positions we've just set, 50 and 540 respectively. This is where our curve is going to start. And well, for everything else, we just leave that to the coach function. Remember that the first parameter is the degree, so to speak. Since we only have the base case implemented, we are not going to put in any value other than 1, because nothing is going to happen. The length here is going to be 1180, that's going to cover most of the canvas. Fingers crossed that everything is working correctly, you should get something like this. That's right, that is the base case of the coach curve. If you're seeing this, that's good, we're almost done. Now, all that's left is the recursive case. Stick an L statement in, and guess what? The code going inside the else statement is basically the same thing, except instead of just walking forward, you are making a recursive call. What's critically important here is that you have to call the n-1 version and not, well, the n version. This is how you actually get the curve to sort of diminish in scale and eventually stop when the recursion depth that has been selected is exceeded. Make sure you get this right, otherwise you'll get code that never stops, and nobody wants that. Now, just to be very clear, let's actually go ahead and trace through this and see why this works. Firstly, we want to draw a Koch curve for just one third of the length. We want to rotate our turtle, and then draw another Koch curve in this direction. Rotate again, draw another Koch curve, rotate again, draw another Koch curve. And what you end up with is, well, your second level Koch curve. Of course, that's assuming that we're running this on the level 2 version of the Koch curve. Really, this works on, well, Koch curves of any degree. You can actually test this by going back to your init function and changing 1 to 2. If all goes well, you should see your second degree Koch curve. Tweak the number however you like, and you're going to be able to generate a Koch curve of any degree. Now, word of warning here, you don't want to use, you know, a too big number. What's going to happen is you're going to create many recursive calls that's going to take forever to evaluate. What I have here is up to level 8, which is still, you know, kind of okay. Level 8 takes about slightly less than a second on my browser. And the thing is, well, you can basically not really resolve any more detail. So there's no point going further. Going further is just going to take more time and then not do very much for you. So yeah, do take note of that. Now, as with all of my projects, one thing I like to do is to sort of enhance the hell out of it. So basically what you're seeing here is a slightly different version of the Koch curve. 
In fact, this is just three Koch curves aligned in a triangular pattern. You will see one here, another here, and another one here. So what I've done here is, well, I'm able to actually generate Koch curves on a shape. This program lets me basically configure things however I like. For example, I can build something with more sides, and then render it out, and then, well, you see a more complex shape. I can sort of move and rotate things, change the size, change the recursion depth. Let's make something, you know, not as complex this time. So yeah, this is what is called a Koch snowflake. It does kind of look like, you know, a little bit of snow. So yeah, remember that, you know, every little programming project can always be taken to the extreme and you're encouraged to, well, experiment however you like until you find something that, you know, is satisfying. So yeah, given what you've already known, you know, up to this point, you should be able to build something like this without much issue. This is just sticking multiple Koch curves together. You know, the GUI is optional. You can, of course, leave that to later. Just some ideas as to what you can actually do. So there you have it. That is the Koch curve. And if you understand this implementation, then you understand the fundamentals of recursion. That's all there is for this particular episode. I hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun. But yeah, that's it. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.